And we're live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We're celebrating Oceans Day. Hello. We're celebrating World Oceans Day today. Um, and so really what we're trying to do is recognizing the importance of oceans in our daily life and trying to talk a little bit about why we need to protect such a valuable and vulnerable resource. Um, and so to help to garner greater interest and action for our oceans all over the world. In June, we celebrate World Oceans Week and today, World Oceans Day. So joining us, we have Michelle and Julie. They are underwater photographers and they're gonna talk to us a little bit today about what they do. And so with that, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Good to be here. Um, Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi. We're good to go? Yes. Okay. Um, so happy World Ocean Day, everyone. Uh, happy to have you with us. Um, why is World Ocean Day important? Well, as we were mentioning, it's important to protect our oceans because they're a vital uh, source of life on our planet. Uh, they provide a lot of oxygen for the planet, and as well, they provide a lot of food uh, for those of you who like fish. Uh, so very important food source that's important to protect and uh, also the biodiversity of our oceans, which is very um, important on our planet. And another very important reason why it's important to protect our oceans and to take care of them, well, they're very much still unexplored. Uh, we still know very little about our, our oceans. Actually, uh, some people say that we know more about the moon than we do about our own oceans. So those are one of, some of the main reasons why we find that World Ocean Day is a very good uh, way to share with people who don't have a chance to see our oceans why they're so important. And um, our job is, uh, as uh, Melissa mentioned, uh, we're uh, underwater photographers and uh, Julie, she's an uh, underwater videographers. Uh, so what we do is that we travel around the world and uh, we scuba dive uh, to document uh, the marine life that we found in our oceans, but also in our lakes and rivers. Um, we also do uh, some commercial work where we uh, take photos, for example, to write articles in magazines or uh, to put videos on website. Uh, so we can share and um, and share to people who don't scuba dive uh, what's going on underneath the waves. Uh, we also plan expeditions. We're expedition leaders, uh, so we do trips uh, to common places like uh, touristical places uh, in other countries in the world. But we also organize expeditions uh, that are uh, super unique. Uh, like we did uh, two scientific missions uh, that we led to uh, the most isolated atoll on the planet, Clipperton Atoll. Um, and everywhere we go, we document the, uh, the, the marine life and the underwater world. What we love about our job and our, uh, the, the, the fact that we work with the ocean is that, uh, well, we're passionate scuba divers to begin with. Uh, we love to uh, work outdoor. Uh, we uh, also love animals, all sorts of animals. So by traveling, we see different type of animal on the water, but also on land. And uh, of course, we get to explore, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we see incredible animals and, and different things, and we're going to show you some a little bit later. So for Ocean Day, what we decided to do is rather than talk to you about a specific place or a specific expedition that we've led, uh, we do very uh, informal little little sections where we're going to talk to you about our favorite animals. Uh, we're also going to talk to you about uh, cool animals we see underwater and some of their behaviors, which are super interesting. Uh, some of them you probably will have never seen before. Uh, we'll talk to you about our special places, our favorite places, our favorite expeditions. And also, uh, we'll begin with some of the important issues that our oceans face. Now, uh, you may have heard of the fact that there's a lot of plastic in our oceans. Who's heard of this? Raise your hands. Okay, so uh, plastic is a humongous problem and we're now just starting to understand how big it is. To give you an idea, uh, we think that there's 8 million tons of plastic that enter our oceans, our rivers, and our lakes. That's huge. 
And uh, for every one ton of plastic, there's one ton of plastic, sorry, for every three tons of fish by 2025. So that's not so far away. And we also think that by 2050, uh, experts, that's what they uh, are estimating, that by 2050, there will be more plastic in our oceans than there will be fish. So that's just to give you an idea how important the problem is. And just to give you an idea, since you're probably on metric systems, one ton is the equivalent of 1,000 kilograms. So that's a lot of plastic. So it's important to talk about it. So what I thought I'd do is I'd show you some of the images um, that we've been filming, some of the things we've seen on our trips or on our expeditions, just to show you how bad the problem is. Because a lot of us don't live near the oceans. Um, we don't live near the oceans. So we think it's a problem uh, that's far away, and we don't exactly know how important it is. Now, this is one example. Can you guys see the, the screen well? Hopefully that's a yes. Yes, we can see. <laughs> okay, so here we have little animals. As you see, these are nets that were just floating in the middle of the ocean, uh, pieces of rope, and all the little fish are hiding around it. Um, but what's important to know is that's a good protection for these small fish. But on the other hand, and you see uh, we're trying to circle right now, there's a fish right there. I don't know if you see your pointer. Um, but basically that little fish is just trying to hide under the ropes. But bigger animals can get caught in these nets. Now this is an example, sea lions. They're really playful, but sometimes if you look at this guy's neck, he's got a big scar around his neck. This is caused by a fishing net that was caught and is now uh, ripping through the animal's neck. Other big animals get caught in nets. For example, whales, it's a big problem. There's over 100,000 animals that get caught in nets every year and die. This is a whale rescue that we documented off of Mexico a few years ago. And the rescue eaters here are actually trying to pull the net off the whale because if they don't, probably the whale will die because this was a baby whale that as it gets bigger, the whale uh, gets caught up in the net and the net does not grow with the whale. So here, this was a successful rescue and the rescuers were able to free the whale. But entanglements can get much worse in this case the next images you see are of a very severe case where if rescuers don't manage to take these nets off the whale, it will actually drown. Now we've seen plastic in the most remote places of the world. Uh, here's an image of a place in Indonesia. And as you see, it looks really uh, wild. But when you look closer, first thing you notice is all this plastic that's floating um, inside of little lagoons and everywhere you go. This is a deserted beach in a, in a marine, uh, natural reserve park where we see monkeys. Here in the ocean, you see there's a plastic bag that's floating. And turtles often mistake these bags for jellyfish, which they eat. Um, another example here, nets that are also made out of plastics. Uh, so again, another source of plastic that stays in our ocean if we don't remove um, the lines that you see here. Michael is actually removing a piece of line that was, again, caught up on the net. And this next image is of all the plastic that was stuck in a sea cave. You see now the air is blowing out all the trash that was there. And I guess I don't need to tell you what this is, but this was also in the ocean. It also affects plastic, the animals that are on land. For example, these are Komodo dragons. Look at all the trash that's around them. And the next images you're gonna see are uh, from our expedition to Clipperton. Again, the birds are, are pecking on this plastic and eventually if they eat it, it will kill them because their stomachs will fill with it. So these are the kind of images that we're seeing all around the world, not just little pieces of trash, but enormous pieces of trash. So it's super important to limit your plastic use, try to avoid plastic bottles because you will see a lot of them in these images. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do. And all this plastic, eventually what happens is it breaks down into small, small pieces. Uh, the next image you see here are the little tiny pieces of color. They're all little pieces of plastic. And uh, recently we went on an expedition to try to evaluate how much of this plastic is floating in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So we actually crossed the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to New York. And what we're using to sample is what you see here. It's called a manta trawl. And it basically skims the surface of the water for a period of either a half hour or an hour at a time. And all the plastic that accumulates on the surface and that goes through the net will eventually end up at the end of the trawl in a section that we can then remove and try to see what was there. So we did these samples, like I was saying, crossing the Atlantic. So in the middle of nowhere to see if there was microplastics. And why is this important? Well, animals like whales, for example, 
will feed on uh, at the surface and often swallow these pieces of plastic. So now you see a bit inside of the net what it looks like. And we're going to be pulling up the net to see what we found. Now we're removing this, the end of it to see what was found inside. And the next image is, is when we look at what was the content. You can see already we're seeing little bits of plastic with, along with little animals that got caught up in the net. These are all pieces of plastic. And what we were looking for, the very small pieces, because we wanted to evaluate how big the problem was. So see, we're finding them in each sample we're taking, which proves to us that it's a problem all over the world, even when we're very, very far from civilization. Oops, sorry. So uh, Julie talked about uh, the marine debris uh, that we found in the ocean, but I'm going to show you uh, some very cool stuff that we see on the water. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, my favorite animal uh, in, in the water is the sharks. Uh, this photo here is a photo of a silky shark that I took in uh, Baja, Mexico. Uh, that we were snorkeling uh, with pelagic sharks. Actually, you don't need to be a scuba, di a scuba diver to uh, make those observations. Just by snorkeling, uh, you can uh, encounter uh, silkies pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, the next image is um, a school of uh, scalloped hammerhead that we took in the Galapagos. And we actually had to surface uh, in, in the middle of that school because we were low on air and it was time to come up. So the sharks were passing left and right um, on top of us, uh, underneath us. And that was a pretty cool experience. As you can see, they're very numerous in those uh, two islands north of the Galapagos. Uh, this one has been shot in uh, Cocos Island in Costa Rica. Uh, what you see here is uh, white tip sharks that are hunting at night. So it's a night dive. And uh, what they do is they cooperate together and uh, push the, the fish um, towards the, the mouth of their, um, their companion uh, to uh, eat at night. So that's the way they, uh, they work together. Uh, that's another cool uh, shark. It's a whale shark. It's a filter feeders. So they don't have teeth per se. Uh, they just filter water to eat plankton. And you can see the size of this shark is, is about uh, 30 feet. If you compare that to the snorkeler, uh, that's about the size of a car, a big car, or close to a bus, I would say. And uh, this one is a blue shark. It's been taken in uh, Rhode Island uh, in the U.S. Uh, again, it's a snorkeling experience, so you are at the surface of the water and you can uh, experience uh, uh, swimming with sharks. Uh, sometimes we use bait to uh, do what we call a shark feeding, and this was taken in Fiji. What you see here is a bull shark. Uh, that's the signature species of this uh, dive, but you can uh, see up to eight different species of sharks on the same dive. Uh, the next one is an oceanic white tip shark. Uh, there's two places in the world uh, where you can uh, reliably encounter them because they've been um, uh, fished out of the ocean. There's only those two places. Uh, this one was shot in the Red Sea in Egypt, uh, but you can also see them in Cat Island in the Bahamas. And uh, this one is, uh, you might have seen a viral video of a walking shark. Well, this shark uses pectoral fin here to kind of walk uh, on the bottom. It's uh, uh, in the family of the carpet shark. It's called a nipplelet shark. Uh, and this one is a great hammerhead. Now, I've talked about the scalloped hammerhead. Well, this one is very different in the way that it's way bigger. It can grow up to uh, six, seven meters. And uh, they're solitary compared to the scallop hammerhead who tends to school together. Uh, this one, we saw them in uh, Bimini in the Bahamas. Uh, 
And the last two are carpet sharks as well. This one is called a Wobegong. Um, they're called carpet shark because they have some unique patterns, uh, the camouflage patterns on their skin that looks a bit like a carpet. Uh, they, they rest on the bottom of the ocean and they, uh, con contrary to the other sharks, they don't need to move to uh, respire. They can breathe uh, by uh, some, some little holes that they have close to the eyes. Uh, this one is called a bamboo shark. Now, the reason that why I love sharks is mostly because they're so gracious and they're uh, misunderstood. Uh, they're not dangerous animal like uh, movies like Jaws want to want us to believe. They're they're just animals that we need to treat with respect, and uh, and it's it's pretty easy to scuba dive with them and encounter them. Uh, but they have been fished out of the ocean for their their fins. Uh, there's a huge demand for uh, the shark fins for, the, for to make soups, and uh, there, there's an estimated uh, 200 million sharks being fished out of the ocean every year. The estimate is is uh, is very variable, but uh, that's um, a number we hear. So and now I want to show you now. I think you've understood that really we really 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 like sharks. Um, I'm going to show you some of the behaviors. What I really like about doing video is that I get to uh, document the behaviors of various animals. Now I'll show you a few. You see here we have an octopus, and look at the blue ring on its side. Notice how it's flashing and the colors are changing. Well, this is a very poisonous octopus, and what it's trying to tell us is stay away if you want to don't want to die because it's more dangerous than a shark. If you uh, get its venom, you will probably die. Another example of color change. Look at this guy, how he's changing colors and all of a sudden gets a zebra pattern. This is a cuttlefish. And while well, this second one is just trying to show off and take advantage of the camera. But again, they're communicating by these patterns. The next thing you see, housekeeping. Yes, fish do housekeeping. Now this uh, is called a jawfish and it lives in a burrow. And once in a while, well, it needs to clean house and take out the trash from his burrow. And like house cleaning for humans, well, it's just never done. There's always more to do. Next behavior we're gonna look at here. Territorial. This little fish is tiny, but it doesn't like me being there, even there close to where it lives. As you can see, it's telling me, go away. Here, if you look at behind the orange fish, you see white little spots. These white little spots are the fish's eggs. So this fish is trying to get close to his eggs, fan the eggs and protect them. And the next image you see is a type of clownfish, the same family as Nemo. And all those silver spots are tiny, tiny little eggs with tiny little fish that are about to hatch. So the parents, what they do is they keep air around the uh, eggs so they will hatch and the fish will be uh, in good health. And here, extreme parroting. Mama doesn't want us to get too close to her nest. And here we have it in replay. I didn't actually see the nest until I understood when the fish was coming at me, but you have to be very careful with these trigger fish because again, they protect their young. Here's another example. You have two fish in the middle, but if you look carefully, there's a striped blue and silver fish that's going around them. Well, this fish is actually cleaning these bigger fish and there are many fish in the ocean that it, it cleaned. Of the smaller fish, they will eat dead skin, they will take off parasites. Uh, same thing happens with sharks and rays. Schooling is another very uh, important uh, behavior in the world, the oceans. See, so you have very different types of fish here and they're all staying together and that gives them protection. And the next image that you will see is extreme schooling. As you can see, there are tons of fish here. And you can guess that the ones that are in the middle are a whole lot safer than the ones that are on the side. So if a predator comes in, well, the idea is to be as packed in them and look big so you'll scare the predator and also, well, only the ones on the sides will be the unlucky ones. Here we have camouflage. See how this spiny devilfish is super hard to spot even when it's moving. And this is another example. It's called a stargazer. This fish actually buries itself into the sand waiting to catch prey. You can hardly see it. And this is another guy that has a cool behavior. It yawns. This is a rhinopia. Usually they're very immobile, but if you stay long enough in front of them, you may catch a yawn, maybe two. And if you're really, really lucky, 
you'll even catch one that's walking. I thought this one would be fun with music. See how it looks super clumsy? Almost like it's gonna fall over. And the next one, well, animals play. These are sea lions. They just love to play. They nibble on anything, especially when they're young. So this one really liked my fin. This one really liked my camera. And he really wants me to go play with him. So are they cute enough for you? Okay, next subject. Michael. So the question we get asked the most is uh, where is our favorite place to scuba dive in the world? Well, it's very hard to say which one would be the, the best one or the preferred one, but we do really, really like Indonesia. Uh, in Indonesia, people are super friendly, and uh, that shows also uh, when we scuba dive. There is a place called Alor in Indonesia, that's an, uh, an island, where uh, Indonesians are always playing in the water. And uh, I made a selfie here with one of, uh, of the guy that went free diving to have his uh, selfie taken with me. And as you can see, they have goggles that they made out of wood. And they take some, um, some uh, the, the bottom of a glass bottle to uh, do lenses that they glue there. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool stuff. And uh, what I like about Alor is uh, that there's a lot of very, very small creatures. Uh, the orange things you see in the middle is called an orangutan crab. So you, you, I guess you know why it's called a orangutan. Uh, this one is a, a type of shrimp uh, that is uh, found, and it's very, very, very tiny. It's probably half the size of your uh, uh, the, of your nail. So that's a very tiny shrimp. And this is the rhinopia that uh, you saw previously on Julie's video. Uh, it's called the holy grail of uh, the mock diving. Mock diving is uh, places you go to scuba dive uh, where there's not a lot of coral, but lots of camouflage creatures. Um, as you can see, it's pretty camouflage. You can find also some very, very tiny squid. If you look, you'll see that uh, you see the, the sand grain surrounding the, this uh, uh, bobtail squid uh, that is uh, not that bigger. So that's super, super small as well. So you need very good eyes. And you would recognize this guy that's um, a seahorse. Uh, you can find them also over there. But there's not just the small stuff. There's also uh, the camouflage, uh, not the camouflage, the, the coral stuff or the anemone in this case. Uh, this place is called Anemone City and it's covered, it's carpeted with, with anemone everywhere. And what you see in the middle of the screen is called a sea crate. Or it's a sort of snakes uh, that live uh, underwater. The other place we really like is Baja. Baja is uh, on the western side of Mexico, uh, the portion that extends into the ocean uh, south of California. Uh, the reason why we like uh, Baja so much is that there's enormous school of fish. Uh, this one is in uh, Cabo Pulmo, uh, where you see some uh, uh, big eye jack, and it's it's huge school, so huge that it nearly blocked all sunlight. As you can see, only a little uh, lights pass through this densely packed uh, school. And here what you see is a school of barracuda uh, that were from 90 feet down all the way to the surface. So that's, that's pretty impressive. And I'm talking about huge school of fish. 
This is Julie right here in the middle of the, just above the middle of that huge school. And I'm going to show you another one that it's uh, the same school. And Julie went underneath. And as you can see, it's all dark. So it's looked like she's went through a cave uh, made out of fish. So that's, that's uh, the size of school you encounter. And as Julie mentioned, uh, there is a place in La Paz where you can play with uh, sea lions. Uh, they, they like to nibble on everything. Uh, there's another place in La Paz that you can, uh, again, swim with whale sharks. Uh, those huge sharks that I told you about that, that uh, filter feed the water. And that's another place called Midriff where you also have some uh, whale shark over there. But there's also some other type of whales in the area. This is the humpback whale uh, that breach uh, often... Uh, to uh, or attract uh, mates or uh, to fish for smaller fish. Uh, this is uh, another place in La Paz where you can scuba dive at night with mobula rays. And what they do is that they, uh, they are attracted uh, by the lights. Well, the, the plankton that, that you see, the kind of dust particle that you see, it's plankton. So the plankton is attracted by the lights and then the, the mobula ray is going to go for the plankton. So that's how you would attract the mobulas by lighting the plankton. And in Socorro Islands, uh, there is a place called, uh, an island called San Benedicto, where you can encounter those huge manta rays that can uh, grow up to seven meters from uh, tip to tip. Uh, of their wing and you have a scale with its little little scuba diver uh, in the background and the other things you see when you go to the Socorro Islands is sharks of, of course uh, those one are called white tip sharks and you can often find them uh, piled up like by the dozens so that's the two places we really really like so basically, um, our goal today was more to show you very different stuff and show you things we really like about the ocean and why uh, we're so passionate about protecting them. Um, we never stop getting amazed by all the fascinating creatures, whether they're this big or whether they're humongous the size of a bus. They're all fascinating and they're all important to protect and they all play a vital role in the ecosystem. And again, like we said, our oceans are, are very unexplored. We're discovering new creatures, new species uh, all the time. And um, we're hoping that by showing you these images, we, we are, are telling you that it's important to care about our oceans. And maybe someday you'll want to have a career in the, uh, that has something to do with diving or the oceans. And um, basically, that's what we wanted to tell you today. And hope that we've uh, showed you things maybe that you've never seen and get you excited about our oceans. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Julie and Michelle. <laughs> so we have lots of time for some questions. Well, some time. We have well, not lots of time. We have some time <laughs> for some great questions from our students. So maybe we could start with Miss Faye's class. I'm going to see if I can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice and loud. There you go. Okay, that's your question. How many animals are there in the sea? Oh my gosh, um, I have no idea. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Too many to count. <laughs> Probably millions, if not billions. That's a very tough question. We're not smart enough to answer that one, I don't think. <laughs> Okay, come here, but we another Maybe class. you guys could help when you're grown ups. You guys could uh, do some investigating and discover some new species in the ocean. <laughs> Add to the total that we know about. <laughs> do you guys have one more question? We can keep going through, but we do, we all right. How old were you when you started? A uh, scuba diving? Yeah. Well, the, the first time I did scuba dive, I was eight years old. Wow. And, and you can try it uh, when you're eight years old, and you can be fully certified by 10 years old. So, so you can pretty much all scuba dive. And there's no age for snorting. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for those questions, guys. Should we try? Um, 
the students with Miss Somerville. Let's see if we can. Make this some more because it looks like we'll have time for lots of questions. I'm gonna close. Miss Faye, are you able to turn your microphone? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Miss Somerville, students, I'm not it's able not to unmute you. Can you do it yourself? Yeah. Awesome. Um. What place do you think is affected the most by pollution? Um, I think it's hard to answer because a lot of people think that Asia is a big problem. Um, Asia has a lot of pollution just because there, there's so many people that live there compared to North America. But in proportion, actually, North Americans pollute more uh, than Asians. So the, the problem is more visible in some places of the earth. Uh, but it's it's I don't think there's one uh, place that we need to yeah. focus on to say that it's the worst place. I think that each place is important. And even if we have small oh. amounts of pollution, because here in Canada or the U.S., we, we think it's not so bad because we don't see it as much. But if we look carefully, there yeah. still is pollution. So we need to treat every place like it's the worst place and take care of all of them. If, if you look uh, carefully, even in, in uh, like Judy mentioned, in, in Canada and the U.S., and you go alongside the road and you stop, just go in the, the ditch and, and the surrounding uh, vegetation, and you'll see there's a lot of plastic and lots of trash. Uh, so you don't need to go very far. But uh, um, is there a place that are worse than the other? I think the... Uh, the the only answer we can give is that everywhere there's oceanic current that's pushing the trash in one direction, you'll have an accumulation. But that doesn't mean that this place pollu pollu um, did more pollution. It means just that the current is pushing all the trash at the same place. Uh, when we went to Clipperton at all, uh, we were shocked by the quantity of trash that were everywhere, like every uh, meter you would find another trash and some places only centimeters between all, all the little plastic parts so that's that's pretty bad and one thing we didn't mention about Clipperton is it's an it's an island that has had nobody no one living on it for over 70 years so the trash that we're seeing there is not coming from people that are living there it's coming from everywhere else on earth being pushed by the oceans thanks for your question Great question. Thanks, ladies. We'll circle back around. We'll see if Miss um, Michael's class, if you guys have a question. Uh, we can't hear you. Huh? Yeah, there we go. We can hear you now. Okay. So come on up and introduce yourself. And then you had a question. Um, we have a couple of questions. Okay. So what inspired you guys to do this? Uh, Beat us. Um, well, it's funny because we actually live in, in a place where we're more surrounded by, by farms and fields. So we live uh, far away from the ocean. And I think both of us fell in love with the ocean. Um, for me, the first time I set my eyes and looked under the water, what I saw there was so fascinating. And for me, it just became life changing. I, I never wanted to do anything else after that. So I guess it's just, it's just a spark. It's just something that we both saw and both loved. And again, we're very privileged and not a lot of people get the chance to see what we see and witness what we witness. And for us, it's very important to share that. Um, to me, I think that uh, the aspect of uh, scuba diving, uh, I had two, two main uh, things about it. Uh, first thing, I, when I was young, I wanted to be an astronaut. And as you know, it's not easy to be an astronaut. So the closest thing I could find to explore uh, and, and satisfy my curiosity was to scuba dive. And we get to go places that nobody goes. Uh, and my second point was uh, because I love so much all type of animals, I get to work with animals, I get to see animals, uh, not just the marine animals, because where we travel, there's also some unique places like uh, we, uh, we went in Indonesia, uh, we got to film some uh, macaques in, uh, in the forest, in the natural forest. So that's, that's the two things that uh, inspired me. Uh, enough that uh, I decided to quit my regular day job to concentrate on just scuba diving and filming. And underwater we can fly. 
<laughs> can, we, can we get a, another one in? Of course. Okay, Simone, come on up. So you by the mic. Um. So, what was your favorite thing about this like project you were doing? About, I'm sorry. Like, what is what was your favorite part about it? Like, uh, doing, uh, like photographs underwater. Uh, I guess for me, uh, a lot of it is again sh seeing behavior, seeing how animals act, discovering things that we don't know that certain fish do or certain animals do. And just seeing different different animals from one place to the other, uh, that for me is the funnest part. And it's really it's really uh, fun when you get to interact with animals like the sea lions. They want to play with you. They want to know what you are. Uh, sharks, same thing. A lot of them are curious, so they'll come to see. They'll check you out. Um, so having that contact is really really fun. Um, I would say the same thing, and I would add on on top of that, that uh, we also use our images to make discovery. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, we were on an expedition in uh, Baja at one point. We, we came back through Baja, and uh, we did some uh, scuba dive with the big giant manta rays. And by photographing them, what you find is that on their belly, they have some, some spots that are different from every individual's. So by photographing the belly, you can identify a, uh, an individual uh, manta. And what happened is that we found a new one. So that was, that was pretty cool to actually be able to discover a new manta. And uh, in Clipperton, we did the same thing. We did photograph all the species we found. And uh, we hope that we might have found a new one. Uh, there are still four species on the review that uh, could be a discovery. So by photographing, you can uh, document new species and discover new stuff. I have one more student, and we're almost uh, ready to, to go back to uh, our classrooms. Could I get one more in? Yeah, for sure. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, what's your favorite place out of, out of all the ocean and lakes West, um, West. or rivers have you scuba, scuba dive in? Or maybe say species. Well, we like all of them because sometimes we just dive in lakes and even in the winter we go diving under ice where we're not under ice to see fish, we're more under ice just to just dive in the winter and look how uh, the ice looks from underneath. So they're all very fascinating. Rivers are really cool also. You can look at salmon and all kinds of stuff. We also have um, in Canada and around the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River, we also have tons of shipwrecks. So that's pretty cool to go inside a ship and see uh, what the life was, uh, let's say, in the 1800s because everything's still in place. Oh, I bet that would be fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> awesome. well, thank, you. thank you so much. We're going to have to go. This is a lunch club here, so these kids have been here during their lunch hour. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Miss Faye's class, do you guys have another question? We have a few. Okay. Hello. Um, what's the old, your oldest shipwreck, and um, have you ever – found any treasure in one of them? Uh, the oldest, I would say beginning of 1800s, um, or maybe, maybe end of 1700s, I don't know. Lake George. Yeah. 1758, I think, the exact date is the oldest shipwreck yeah. we dove on. You're and right. And it's in the US, it's in uh, New York State. And it's considered the oldest warship uh, in North America. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was pretty old. But no, yeah. no treasure on it. Sorry. The, and and for the treasure, <laughs> it really depends on on uh, what what you're looking at. Not nothing like gold. Uh, but I found once I found um, uh, a driver's license from someone that lost it in, on the ship in the 70s. And I returned the driver's license to the person, so I guess that could be considered a treasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Very cool. Good question. Okay. 
Um, if somebody was interested in um, doing this, what do you need to do? That's, that's a very good question as well. Um, I think that it, if you have the interest, uh, everything's going to come together. But I would say that the first step would be to take a scuba diving certification and uh, scuba dive as much as you want and explore. And uh, that's the two, the, the, the two main things. You start scuba diving and be interested. Everything else is going to follow. And then if you want to have a career that's more towards science, well, there are very uh, various uh, programs that you can look into when you're in college or university that you can specialize either in marine biology or archaeology, depending on what you prefer. So there are a lot of ways to get into this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no problem. Do you guys mind if we take one question from our students in Waterloo? Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back. Okay, <laughs> okay. great. Waterloo students, I think you have to unmute your microphone. Which place that you've been to has the most variety of animals? Variety, you said? Yes, the most variety. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. Um, I think Indonesia is pretty strong. Uh, it lies in the, um, in the middle of the what they call the Coral Triangle, which is one of the most diverse uh, area of the world. Uh, there's other countries in that same triangle, but uh, Indonesia is pretty strong. Good question. All right, should we go back to Miss Bay's class? Yeah, I know you had another question. Hi. Hi. Hello. I'm wondering what type of species of sharks was your favorite? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I could go on all day <laughs> because I love them all. Uh, I think the silver tip sharks is probably my favorite one just because it's so slick and um, it, the shiny uh, white uh, part on top of their fins is, is is like immaculate white, and you get that that very uh, sharky shape. Uh, and if they move quite fast, you'll see their muscle, their muscle line on the side of the shark. So, I guess it's it's a very cool shark. I like them all, but I like blue sharks. Uh, mm -hmm. You saw a photo of a blue shark earlier, and their eyes—they look like characters from from. Um, a comic book. They have like these big black eyes and they're really funny and they're really curious because the way that they make contact with you is they call them bumpy sharks. They like to bump into you. So they come at you and they bump your camera and they bump your legs and they're like, hey, how are you? I like you. Okay, I'll be back. And then they scoot off and then they come back. So they're really fun. <laughs> that was a great question. <laughs> All right, we can do one more quick question from each group. So, do our Waterloo students want to do their last question? We do have one more. Okay. How fast can blue sharks swim? Hmm, blue sharks. Good question. Um, On top of my head, I don't know the answer, uh, but I know the answer for the mako shark just because we just did uh, an article about it, and they, they can go as fast as 68 kilometers per hour. That's super fast. But blue sharks are a bit slower, so maybe, how about we guess for maybe half? <laughs> but don't quote us on that, it's not a scientific opinion. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right, our students in Waterloo, Ontario, do you want to ask a final question? Uh, on average, how many pictures do you take on a dive? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> we take a lot. Um, Michael, how many pictures can you take? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess that it really depends where we are. Uh, if we're in, the, um, let's say, in more murky water like a lake, I take less because particles, when you take a photo uh, and your flash goes on, it's going to light the particles. So the photo is not going to be as good. So I tend to take, I don't know, maybe 50 photo per dive. Uh, but sometimes I go crazy, like uh, if we go in Indonesia and there's lots of small creatures that I've never seen before, I can go crazy and go for 
I don't know, three, four hundred for dive? <laughs> Good video. Well, maybe if we're on a, a dive that lasts for an hour and a half. Uh, again, if there's a lot going on, maybe I'll have an hour. <laughs> so that's a lot. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for so many great questions. And thank you to Michelle and Julie for joining us. We hope you guys have a wonderful World Oceans Day. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay, kids, Thanks. don't forget to go to Madison. Madison! Bye bye! Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good day, guys. Bye. <laughs>